Hello and welcome to the slideshow presentation over Marxism. I'm going to go over Marxist interpretation, some of the basics, and we will apply this to some of the things that we see in the Michael Moore films later on uh, as well. So I'm going to read through some of the basics about Marxism with you, uh, and we will apply this to other things in the class, uh, really throughout the course. Ultimate reality, declares Marxism, is material, not spiritual. What we know beyond any doubt is that human beings exist and live in social groups. All of our actions and responses to such activities as eating, working, and even playing are related in some way to our culture and society. In order to understand ourselves and our world, we must first acknowledge the interrelatedness of all of our actions within society. For example, if we want to know who we are and how we live, we must stop trying to find answers by looking solely to religion or philosophy and begin by examining all aspects of our daily activities within our own culture. When examining our daily routines, including our beliefs and values, we will discover that it is our cultural and so social circumstances that determine who we are. What we believe and what we value in many ways, what we think, are direct results of our culture and our society, not our religion or our philosophy. Society is built on a series of ongoing conflicts between social classes. The chief reason for these conflicts is the varying ways the members of society work and use their economic resources. According to Marx, the various methods of economic production and social relationships they engender form the economic structure of society called the base. In America, for example, the capitalists exploit the working classes, determining their salaries and their working conditions, among many other elements of their lives. For this, Base, maintains Marx, arises as the superstructure or a multitude of social and legal institutions, political and educational systems, religious beliefs, values, and a body of art and literature that one dominant social class, the capitalists in America, for instance, uses to keep in check members of the working classes. So as you see, uh, Marx views things as political and really puts an emphasis on one's culture as he would say, one's culture determines the belief system that one has. For example, if you're born in Japan, there's a good chance you're going to be Buddhist because of where you're born, so your culture dictates your religion. That's what he's trying to suggest. The ending of what I read there, in America, for instance, uh, we have the capitalist in control. Uh, well, turn on the TV and look at the advertisements. Drive down the street and look at the billboards. Uh, it is the uh, the top 1%, which we'll refer to throughout the slideshow and the class, uh, that has a lot of influence over what you watch, what you view, what you buy, so forth and so on. Uh, the example here actually goes way back in history, uh, and uh, this is how Marx would interpret why Christianity is the main religion in the West. Granted, this is his take on it, and he focuses on culture uh, and who's in power. It doesn't mean you have to agree with him. There could be a spiritual thing behind it, but he sees things from a cultural standpoint. So Constantine the Great was the one that we often look at uh, to making that conversion to Christianity uh, because he you know, believed he had a spiritual uh, awakening. From the Marxist standpoint, they would simply look at who's in charge. He's in charge. He has the power. Therefore, he transitions uh, them into Christianity and away from the Roman gods and goddesses. Now, they weren't just going to disappear, so he took those holidays and, and, and people after him, too, uh, and put the uh, holidays uh, like Christmas and Easter on top of some of the Roman holidays. And we still have Christmas trees. We still have uh, Easter eggs. So uh, some of those pagan things, of course, have, have still uh, continued to be a part of those traditions. But from a Marxist standpoint, it's those that are in power that control uh, you know, essentially what the belief system is going to be. 
Uh, so the conversion pro uh, process he would look at as being controlled by Constantine the Great and those that were in power uh, and changing that belief system because of that. Uh, and many good things came <laughs> of that, certainly, like uh, they no longer had crucifixion fences out. Uh, so uh, uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, from a Marxist standpoint, it's those that are in power, uh, not necessarily the spiritual aspect of it. Though, uh, of course, <laughs> you're uh, certainly capable of uh, believing whatever direction you want to believe on that. All right, so I'm going to go into the terms bourgeoisie and proletariat. These are two key terms when you're looking at the Marxist interpretation. The bourgeoisie or the capitalist are what we think of here as the top 1%. The proletariat or the wage slaves, well, certainly the lower classes, but uh, I would say middle class and so forth as well. Uh, if you want to look at the last tax cut we had, 85% of that tax cut went straight up to the top 1% bourgeoisie or the capitalist. The other 15%, the rest of us are grappling over, uh, essentially, but it pales in comparison to the amount of money that the bourgeoisie received. So I'll read a little bit uh, from uh, the textbook on this, uh, which uh, kind of covers the basics of the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. Marx argues that the economic means of production within a society, what he calls the base, both engenders and controls all human institutions and ideologies, what Marx calls the superstructure, including all social and legal institutions, political and educational systems, religions, and art. The capitalists or the bourgeoisie had successfully enslaved the working class, or the proletariat, through economic policies and production of goods. Eventually, the upper class will articulate their beliefs, values, and even art, Consciously and unconsciously, they will force these ideas, or what Marx calls their ideology, on the working class, otherwise known as the proletariat or wage slaves. In effect, the bourgeoisie will develop and control the superstructure. In such a system, the rich become richer, while the poor become poorer and more and more oppressed. So Marx would say, essentially, the system we have uh, in place is capitalism. Capitalism by and of itself isn't a bad thing, but when it's unregulated, uh, essentially it's going to lead to most of the money going to the top 1% and uh, making the masses probably poorer and poorer as it goes. So as you uh, look at the bourgeoisie, there are, you know, the billionaires uh, look at the TV networks. We have five or six billionaires that control all the TV networks, satellite networks, so forth and so on. Uh, so that's a lot of power uh, and the propaganda that they can put out uh, and uh, the information that they can put out to get us to consume, uh, to think a certain way, uh, certainly is going to lend itself to uh, swaying some people to perhaps vote against their own fiscal well-being uh, because what's good for the billionaires is not necessarily good for working class people. Uh, so uh, we know 400 capitalists make more money than 150 million wage slaves combined. Um, even the Waltons, the heirs of, of uh, Walmart, uh, make more money than 150 million people uh, combined and they can't really pay their employees so well. Uh, and that's where people start to question, okay, where do we have to balance things? And maybe Marx was right, because it's not, you know, necessarily bad that we have rich people, but when the wealth and income inequality get too much, it might just reach a breaking point. So some examples that you might see in our society, uh, I think with lobbyists, uh, meat cap packing companies uh, would be a good one, as you see there. Uh, they have veggie libel laws, sometimes they call it cheeseburger laws, sometimes they call it the hamburger law, uh, whatever law they're, <laughs> they're calling it. Essentially what happens is they have uh, gotten the legislators to pen up rules that basically say, if you say anything negative about the meat packing company, it's actually a felony. Uh, so E. coli has gotten into the system. Uh, maybe uh, your you know, son or daughter has become ill because of it, and you want to speak out about it. you got to be very careful because you might end up not only with a lawsuit, but actually charged with a felony. Uh, and some people say, has the First Amendment been hijacked? Uh, maybe a valid point. 
uh, health insurance companies, they will lobby and lobby and lobby to make sure that they have all the freedom and power that they want, uh, money that could have easily gone to life-saving surgeries for some of their clients. Uh, and the NRA, et cetera, so forth and so on, uh, because we allow so much money into our system uh, and in campaigning and everything else, uh, it allows, you know, you hear like the Koch brothers uh, and others uh, to have a lot of influence over our culture. So what Marx was saying isn't necessarily that capitalism by and of itself is bad, but it's going to lead to a handful of people having almost all the wealth unless there's some regulation in place. We know that all in all, all, all communism has always been an epic fail uh, in our, you know, in, throughout history. So that's not necessarily the answer. But maybe democratic socialism would work. Democratic socialism would essentially say we need to have some regulations in place. We have to have some protections in place for working class citizens or the proletariat. All right. Well, that's the lecture over Marxist theory. We'll be applying this uh, to the more films throughout the class. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation.